Good morning and happy Easter to each and every one of you. We are so glad to have you join us this morning at Valdosta First Methodist Church for this wonderful service of celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Today we are going to sing and worship our Lord and Savior Jesus. We are going to spend time studying God's word and we are going to spend time fellowshipping with one another as we join in this great and ancient celebration of Easter Sunday. I want to invite you as you come together today just to do a, a couple of things. The first is we've got a phone number up on the screen and if you are brand new here you can send in the word new to that or uh, there's also a QR code in your bulletin you can scan and connect with us that way. And speaking of people who are new, um, exciting news. Uh, if you are here for the very first time, we've got a gift available for you um, in the back and so we would love for you to go and pick it up and, and you might be thinking to yourself, oh, my first Sunday was last week and they didn't have gifts. It's okay. If you first came here in 2024, we're going to let you be grandfathered in. And so just stop back there, see Emily or Matt. They'll be, he'll be back there after the service and uh, they'll get you connected. And we would love to just bless you with uh, just a few things to take with you on your journey. Uh, also wanted to mention that uh, we have, uh, if you're here regularly, you can send the word here to that number. Uh, and if you're joining online, you can send in the word online. I uh, also wanted to mention uh, just a couple of things. Uh, coming up in a couple of weeks, or three weeks actually, on April the 21st, we're going to be having a baptism and membership Sunday. So if you have never been baptized, we're going to give the opportunity in both of our services that day for people to be baptized. And if you have never joined our church, but maybe you've been around for a while or, or maybe even just started coming, we would love to give you an opportunity to join the church on that day. You can talk to Matt or I and we'll get you connected for that. But that's coming up on April 21st and you can, you can send a message to that number as well and we'll just connect with you and know that you want to be a part of that celebration on that day. Well, as we join in worship today, we're going to do something that is a, an ancient, historic practice of the church. And that is, on Easter Sunday, the way that people have traditionally greeted each other, going back to the days of the early church, is they would greet each other in this way. One person would say, Christ is risen, and then the other would respond, he is risen indeed. So me and Matt are going to practice. Christ is risen. Very good. All right, so now we're going to practice. I'll do that part, and you respond to me. Christ is risen. He is risen okay, we're going to have to work on this. It's going to have to be louder by the end of the service. We're, this is the practice round. Let's, let's go ahead and get some practice lumps out of the way. Christ is risen. He is risen All right, now let's do it even bigger. Christ is risen. He is risen All right, now I want to invite you to come to your feet as a sign of the resurrection and greet those around you with that greeting, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed.
Amen. I want to invite you to remain standing as you're able as we join together, affirming our faith through these words of the Apostles' Creed. Now, many of you are familiar with the Apostles' Creed, but some may not be. And essentially what this is, is a long-standing tradition through generations and generations of not just this church, but the church overall, where we come together and affirm our faith by coming down to the very core of what we believe together. And so whether this is your first time or 1,000th time saying the Creed together this morning, I really want to encourage you to pay special attention to these words, most particularly on this Easter Sunday as we declare together that on the third day that Christ rose from the dead, and because of that, that we believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. So would you join me in these words together? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. And as our ushers come forward at this time, let us go to God in prayer to pray a blessing over this offering that is about to be received. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you so much for today and a special day that we can come together and do really what we, we come here to do every Sunday all the time to worship you, God. But we particularly turn our attention towards you today and celebrate your resurrection and celebrate the fact that you did not stay up on that cross, but that you rose from the dead and you gave us eternal life with you, Jesus. So we just pray as we continue to worship you now through this form of giving, that it would be blessed and it would be received to bless this church and equip us to be your hands hands and your feet and to advance the kingdom of God in our community. God, we love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
like to invite you to remain standing as you're able as we hear the scripture reading for this morning. This comes to us from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of these apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, This is what we preach, and this is what you believed. And this is the word of God for us, the people of God, and we say together, thanks be to God. You may be seated at this time as we welcome up Brad Tarpley for a children's message. Good morning. Happy, happy, happy Easter. It's Resurrection Sunday. That's the day Jesus rose from the dead to save us. But you know, What does that really mean? What does that mean to us as individuals? What is the purpose of it? Let's see. I brought some gold hoops to see if we can figure it out together. Um, Let's let the first one represent our lives on earth. I'm going to put it down right here. Now, our beautiful flowers are going to kind of obstruct this view a little bit, but bear with me. The next hoop is going to be God's kingdom in heaven. Now, what do you think? Can we jump from our lives on earth all the way to God's kingdom in heaven without falling, without hurting ourselves, without touching the ground? I don't think so. Maybe 30 years ago, but I know not now. (laughs) I know. Let's try this. That's it. The middle hoop. That made it possible for us to get there, right? Guess what? This represents Jesus. That's the why. That's the why it's so important for us as individuals because he helps us get to heaven. So remember, on this Easter and every day, to rely on Jesus to get us where we need to be. Amen. Thank you. 
Today, we're going to think about the idea of things that are done in vain. Have you ever done something that you felt like was just done in vain, served no purpose, maybe was somewhat worthless? I don't know if you've ever played a, a musical instrument, but I, I've had this experience before where I've played a musical instrument and then I've gone back to listen to the recording and can't hear myself. I was like, ah, it was all in vain. Matt and I are both guitar players, and guitar players, if there's one thing that's true about us, we never think that the guitar is loud enough. And so we'll go back and we'll go, it was all in vain. Where, they, they didn't even have us. All you could hear was the trumpets. The trumpets are great, but all you could hear was them. There will be times, maybe you've had this happen before, where you had people coming over to eat and you had everything ready to go and then they canceled at the last minute and so you're having to freeze things on the fly and you're like, ah, it was all in vain. There are experiences that we have in life where we feel as though what we tried to do didn't end up ultimately serving a purpose. One of those things that we, we do, even though we know it's somewhat in vain, is building sandcastles. I came across a story recently, and I've heard it a few different ways, but it's about a family tradition of going and building a sandcastle. Any of you ever had a tradition like that? And we, on the family beach trip, you go and you build a sandcastle. Maybe some of you will get to do that during spring break this week. And they would get together, and, and this family, it was a multi-generational affair, and they would go and they would build the sandcastle together, and, and the way that it would go is, is they, they would build it, and they would treasure that moment, but inevitably, you know it's in vain. The tide is going to come in, or the wind is going to blow, and the sandcastle is going to be no more. It was there for a moment, and then it will be gone. But on this particular occasion, it was a special occasion because there was a young boy in the family. It was his first time being a part of this family tradition. Also, the grandfather looking on knew with his declining health it more than likely would be the last time that he was able to participate in building the sandcastle. And so they're building it, and you can imagine the people on each end of the spectrum in the family, how they each reacted to it. The young boy becomes disinterested and disengaged and goes and plays with the dog for a little bit. The grandfather knows, hey, this thing's going to blow down. It's no big deal. And he's just kind of looking on and uh, just enjoying the memory and enjoying the time with his family. But there's another boy in the family who is determined not to let this family treasure go to waste. He does not want it to be all in vain. And so as the tide begins to come in, he starts digging a moat around the sandcastle. He starts trying to build up a fortification of sand to keep the water from getting to the sandcastle. And you, you, you know what's going to happen, right? The water is going to get there anyways. It will ultimately be all in vain. The grandfather has the perspective of knowing these things come and go. And he's not caught up in the moment. He's just glad to be there. The young boy is lost, the youngest one has lost interest by this point. And then the dad, the one in the middle of generation, does something ingenious. He pulls out his phone and he takes a picture of the sandcastle. And there, preserved for all time, is a reminder of what they built, even though the water is going to come and knock it all down. Otherwise, they might have felt like, though, it was all in vain. And what we had this morning in this reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is we have essentially Paul saying, this is not like a sandcastle that was here and now is gone. This is something that has meaning. This is something that's going to last. And he says in multiple ways throughout the passage that it is not in vain. It has not been wasted. On a much grander scale than a sandcastle, he wants to make sure that the people he is writing to and us reading this years later know that the resurrection of Jesus was not in vain. There's a question that we probably ought to ask when we come together on Easter Sunday, and that's why do we make such a big deal about the resurrection? Why is it such a big deal? We, we bring in extra flowers. We have extra people playing and the, the musicians and singing. We, we make a big deal about it. We have a pretty color on the front of the bulletin. I mean, all these extra lengths that we go to, all because we want to celebrate the resurrection. You'll put on your prettiest colors. You'll go and take pictures in front of the flower cross. If you haven't done it yet, I'm sure you'll do it after the service. We make a big deal about the resurrection. But what, why is that? Why is it something that all these years later, 
2,000 years later, we are still celebrating and still focusing on and making such a big deal about it. I believe the short answer to that is very simply because it has a purpose. It is not in vain. It is not something that just happened and then we brush over it and keep going with our lives. There is significance to the fact that Jesus Christ is alive, that he is risen and he is risen indeed. And the reason that we sing these songs, the reason that we join together and celebrate in this kind of way is because it made a difference. And Paul is writing to a group of people who were hearing all of these conflicts from, from different points of view in their community. And some people had even started to say, yeah, maybe Jesus rose from the grave, but that doesn't have any lasting significance for us. There, there's nothing really that we're going to gain out of it. They even suggested that, that maybe there wouldn't be the resurrection of us as well, that we wouldn't live into an everlasting life as well. And Paul writes this essentially to say, hold up just a second. This was not in vain. He begins by calling upon what they would have agreed to. And he says, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. And then verse 2, he says this, by this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. And when he says otherwise you have believed in vain, what, what's the, the contrast of that? If you, you, you do believe and you should believe, and it shouldn't be in vain. It should not be in vain. He wants them to know that the gospel had a purpose, and that gospel purpose was for their salvation. The hope of salvation is the first thing that we see that it is why the, the resurrection matters so much, is why the gospel mattered so much. It was their saving grace. It was the fact that they were able to enter into salvation, that they were saved by God's grace, and they celebrated it and recognized it because Jesus was alive. Because Jesus was alive, because he had conquered death, they knew that they could stand on the promise of God's hope and that there was even salvation for their very lives. So first and foremost, we make a big deal about it because of the hope of salvation. But Paul continues and he says, it's not just that. It's not just that we celebrate our salvation. We recognize that there is transformation involved in this. We recognize that there is power involved in this. And he describes the way that the, the message had been received. He says, for, I, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared, and that it goes through all the different people that he appeared to. And what we find within this is we recognize that the resurrection was important. We recognize that the resurrection was essential and foundational because of the confirmation of the witnesses who saw what happened. Because they saw what happened through Jesus and because it had such significance in their lives. Now, to give a little bit of context on this, uh, the, the time that this was written was roughly around 53, 54 A.D., and so this was roughly about 23, 24 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And, and so we, we think that this is roughly about the same distance in time as we are removed from September 11th, 2001. Those of you who were uh, alive when that happened, you, you no doubt remember what happened that day. Those of you who weren't alive when that happened, you still probably know what happened that day. There was mass coverage of it, and, and lots of people uh, know exactly what happened that day. And so none of that is really disputable. But there's also the experiences that people had of what happened that day. Last summer, I was at a reunion for Young Harris College, which was where I was a student on the day of the September 11th attacks. And during the course of our conversation, as me and some of my old friends spent time together, we began conversing about what we had experienced that day. Oh, I remember going to your room and watching the news coverage. I remember us being in that class together when we found out about the second tower falling. And we were just comparing notes and going back and forth about what we had witnessed and what we had experienced. We talked about the chapel service that we went to that afternoon where our campus pastor pulled everybody together to pray and to reflect and how meaningful and powerful of an experience that was. And at no point in that conversation 
did the two or three people that were in our group that weren't students at Young Harris College in 2001, spouses of people who were, chime in and go, I don't think any of that happened. I don't think any of your stories are true. They recognized, based on the testimony of those of us who were there, that it seemed perfectly plausible that this had happened. And that's essentially what Paul is getting across here. The people who saw this, the people who experienced this and saw it firsthand, they're still around to tell about it. And they are still around to tell about it, and we know that it's true, we know that it's confirmed, and because we know that it's confirmed, we know that there is power within it because of the transformation that happened in their lives. And Paul lists off three people individually, in addition to describing the chorus of witnesses, the nearly 500 that saw Jesus raised. And within that, there are three, I think, different lessons that we can pick up from their stories about how they encountered the resurrected Jesus. The first was Cephas. That's another name for Peter, another way of translating Peter. Peter was one of the disciples of Jesus, and Peter had an encounter with the resurrected Jesus that was incredibly powerful. In John's gospel, we're told about Peter denying Jesus right before he was crucified. He didn't want to be associated with him. He didn't want people to know that he was a part of his traveling group, and so he says, I don't know him. And we're told in John's gospel that as he is told that, he is gathered around a charcoal fire trying to stay warm as he's denying knowing Jesus. Fast forward a few chapters. Jesus has been raised from the grave. He appears to Peter, and they gather around a charcoal fire. And as they gather around that charcoal fire, Jesus restores Peter and essentially says, you are restored, you are loved, and he gives him a purpose, and his purpose is to go and be the shepherd and to lead the people, to lead the church. He was given a purpose. Now, what, what, what's significant about that fire? Uh, how many of you know the smell of charcoal when you smell it? I fired up some charcoal this morning, and man, I got in the Easter spirit. I mean, there is something powerful about the smell of charcoal. You'll light charcoal, and people will be walking down the street, and they'll go, smells good what you're cooking. I'm like, I haven't put the meat on yet. It's just the charcoal. It smells awesome. There's something distinctive about it that you would have had an immediate register of, oh, I remember the last time I smelled this. I was there, and I denied Jesus. I fell short. I didn't measure up to what Jesus needed me to do. But here, with that same scent in the air, Jesus is restoring me. He's telling me that I'm loved, and he's restoring me and giving me a purpose. And some of us, I think that we come to Easter, and we might feel like Peter did that we've fallen short, that we have not measured up, that we have maybe denied Jesus, that we have not lived up to what he called us to be. And what we need is a reminder that you too are loved. You too have a purpose and that God can use even you through the transformation of encountering the resurrected Jesus. The second person that's listed is James. Now, James was the brother of Jesus or the half-brother of Jesus, we would say. Uh, James, now, I'm an only child, so I can't attest to this, but I have a, a, a really hard time believing that if you found out that your sibling was the Son of God and the Messiah hadn't been raised from the grave, you might be a little skeptical. And we are told, uh, based on tradition, that James was a little skeptical. He was a little skeptical about this story. But he encountered Jesus raised from the grave himself. And in the midst of his skepticism, he was overcome by the power of God. And James ends up becoming the leader of the church in Jerusalem. While Paul was going and spreading the gospel around to the Gentile world, James, the brother of Jesus, becomes the shepherd and the leader of that church in Jerusalem. He went from not believing of being skeptical to instead believing and trusting in the message of resurrection. And then finally, you have Paul. Paul, who was persecuting the church. Paul, who was working against God, who was working against Jesus, who had turned his back on Jesus and didn't want to believe, didn't want to trust in this new message, in this new powerful story of Jesus being raised from the grave. He, too, encounters Jesus, and he turns his life around. 
When we think about the confirmation of witnesses, it's not just like me and my friends talking about what happened one day in September in 2001 on the campus of Young Harris College. These are people who encountered Jesus, and it changed their life. It changed the trajectory of everything that they did. And it, it's confirmed by the witnesses, not just because their testimony was accurate and trustworthy. It was powerful because of how their lives changed and how God used them in response to their confirmation and their experience of Jesus being raised from the grave. And Paul goes even further in telling his story. He says in verse 9 and 10, For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Now that phrase was not without effect. You know how it's translated in some translations? Not in vain. Not in vain. It was not in vain. It was not something that was wasted. He used what God did in his life, and, and through the grace of God, through God's grace and mercy working within him, he ends up becoming the missionary to the known world at that time, spreading the gospel. Instead of working against Jesus, he goes to proclaiming Jesus. Instead of persecuting the church he is claiming its promise and he is going on because it was not wasted it was something that he saw and it took hold in his life and he couldn't help but share that message with other people and the reality is is that this is the power of transformation the power of transformation that the resurrection matters so much because it leads to transformation in people's lives paul describes this in another place what this looks like in people's lives when they experience the resurrection when they encounter the resurrected jesus and he says in colossians chapter 3 since then you have been raised with christ set your hearts on things above where christ is seated at the right hand of god set your minds on things above not on earthly things for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And then in verse 5, he says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. In other words, you put behind you the old ways of life, and you instead live into the grace of God. You live into the purposes that he has for you. The resurrection is not something that just happened in the life of Jesus. It's an invitation for our lives to be different, for us to be transformed, for us to live in a new and different kind of way. I was thinking about this recently. Uh, I came back across a story I'd heard several years ago by a guy by the name of Carlos Whitaker, who, who tells a story in a book called Kill the Spider. And, and Carlos Whitaker uh, is a, a music leader for churches, and he's spoken and written uh, a pretty good bit. And, and he told this story about a time in his life where he was going through a really difficult time that required a lot of counseling and nurturing. And, and he, he had this pattern in his life of unfaithfulness, of, of not being faithful to God, not being faithful to his family. And, and he went through a, a couple of years of counseling. And after he had gone through a couple of years of counseling, his counselor looked at him and said, hey, I think you need to go to this seven-day intensive counseling session. And he's sitting there thinking to himself, I've just gone through two years of counseling, and now you think I need even more? And, and so he, he, he finally agrees to go, and he said it was kind of like church camp for adults. I'm getting ready to go, and I'm going to spend seven days away from my family. And so my whole family, we load up in the car, and we start driving to this camp. And I realize my parents are getting a little older. You can't just go off the grid for seven days and not tell your parents. So he said, I had to call my mom and dad and let them know, hey, I'm going to be at this camp for seven days. Here's why. And I just wanted you to know, because I won't have my cell phone on me, they're going to take it away from me, I won't be able to be reached, I've got to immerse myself into this experience. And so he, he, he's explaining all this to his parents, and, and like most conversations with parents over the phone, it's mostly a conversation between him and his mom. And then uh, his dad chimes in and says, hey, I'd like to say something. And his dad had been a pastor down in Panama earlier in his life, Panama, the country, not the city. And, and so he, he said, Carlos, let me tell you this story. He said, back when I was early in my ministry, 
serving down in Panama, I had the chance to preach this revival, and it was a three-night revival. And the first night of the revival, this lady named Miss Ramirez comes down, and she says, Pastor, I want you to pray for me. Pray that God would remove the cobwebs from my life. He says, okay. So I said, Lord, we pray that you would remove the cobwebs from Miss Ramirez's life. So she goes back to her seat. They go on with the, the service. The next night, same lady comes walking down the aisle. She gets down to the front, and he's like, oh, goodness, maybe it didn't take. And so she says, Pastor, would you pray that God would remove the cobwebs from my life? So, okay, here we go again. So he, he says, Lord, we ask again that you would remove the cobwebs from Miss Ramirez's life. And so they pray, and she goes back to her seat, and they go on. Third night, last night of the revival, same lady comes walking down. And he's getting a little mad as she's coming down the aisle. She gets down the aisle, and, and she says, Pastor, would you please pray that God would remove the cobwebs? And he interrupts her. He says, no, I will not pray that God will remove the cobwebs from your life. He says, let us pray. And he puts his hand on her and says, Lord, we do not ask that you would remove the cobwebs from Ms. Ramirez's life. We pray that you would kill the spider. <laughs> and telling this story years later to his son who had found himself in lots of moral and spiritual issues and struggles. He said, Carlos... You've been a professional at cleaning the cobwebs in your life, making them look pretty, making it look as though everything's in the right place. But you need to kill the spider. You need to get to the root of what's behind your, your sin and this pattern in your life. And I think he would say, much like Paul said, you need to put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. You need to put it behind you. Don't let the presence of God's grace in your life be in vain. Let it transform you. Let it change you. Let it make a difference so that your life is not only changed, but it ends up changing the lives of others. Now, Carlos Whitaker has taken that story and he's used it as a platform to tell other people who were caught in the same kind of sin that he was in about how the grace of God can give them a way out. And I would contend today that if you are here in this service, you might feel like you are Peter, as though you have failed and have fallen short of God. And you know what God wants to say to you? He wants to say that through the grace of God and the resurrected Jesus in your life, you can be redeemed and you can be loved and that God has a purpose for you. You might feel like James, the brother of Jesus, who stood opposed and was a skeptic. And God would say to you, you don't have to be a skeptic anymore. Believe in the truth and let it set you free. Or you might be like Paul and you feel like your entire life you've been working against God and pushing God out of the way in your life. And what I believe God wants to say to you today is that it is time to let God's grace be present in your life and do not let it be in vain. Sometimes God can do the most miraculous things in our lives if we let him in, if we are willing to surrender our lives and to give him presence and a place in our lives and let God's grace do the work. Last year on February the 8th at a university campus, there was a chapel service and a guy who was a volunteer coach for a soccer team was asked to speak for this chapel service and it was rather uninspiring. He left the service and he sent a text to his wife and said, I laid a stinker, I'll be home soon. I've got a text drafted to send my wife after I leave today that's some, no, I'm kidding. Uh, he, he, he didn't think it was anything great, didn't think anything was special about it, but that worship service never ended for a few weeks. It was the beginning of the Asbury outpouring and revival of 2023. God used what he thought was a waste, what he thought didn't serve a purpose, was not inspiring, and God used it through the presence of the Holy Spirit and the resurrected Jesus to transform that community that people ended up coming from all over the world just to sit in that place and to see what God was doing. In a nondescript 
dingy church fellowship hall at a United Methodist Church in August of 1997, there was a missionary to Ghana, Africa, who got up and spoke about a prophet in the Old Testament. Wasn't the most inspiring message in the world. He might have even thought to himself, oh, it's all in vain. What could God do out of that? But as a 14-year-old kid sitting in the congregation that night, it was everything to me. It was not in vain. Because it was the night that I said, I'm not going to push against God anymore. I'm going to surrender my life and let God's grace and presence be in my life, not be in vain. And from that point on, I let God in and gave God a place in my life so that through the power of the resurrection of Jesus, through the grace offered to us, through our Savior who gave his life upon the cross, that all who have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God might live and be redeemed. I surrendered my life to that, and it transformed me, and it has changed and shaped everything that has happened in my life ever since. And my hope and my prayer is that if you have heard the message of the gospel today. If you have heard the proclamation of God's grace, know that Christ's resurrection is not in vain. Christ is risen in you, and it's not in vain. Christ being risen in you, Christ being risen in you, and you receiving that gift of grace and that gift of hope for yourself is not in vain. And God can use just a little seed, a little opening, and a little surrender in your life to transform you and to change you for what God wants to do through the rest of your life. And so as we close our service this morning, we're going to sing and proclaim that he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. We're going to close our service by lifting out a hallelujah and declaring yet again that Christ is risen and Christ is risen indeed. My hope and my prayer for each and every one of you is that you would leave here and whatever God has spoken in your heart, may it not be in vain. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your truth, for the power of hope offered through the gospel. We pray today for anyone here who feels maybe like Peter, that they've fallen short, that they have let you down. We pray that today would be a day of restoration. We pray for anyone here who feels like James. Maybe they're skeptical. Maybe they aren't quite sure. We pray that your truth would be revealed to them today. And we pray for anyone maybe who feels like Paul. as though they have been actively working against your grace in their life. We pray that your grace would take hold in them today. That it would not be in vain. They would receive it. They would be made whole through it. And just simply following what your word calls for us to do by believing in their heart and confessing with their mouth that you are Lord, that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is raised from the grave, he is risen indeed. That as they receive that message, they would enter into the hope, the promise of resurrection and the promise of life everlasting. I pray that we would leave putting behind us the ways of this world and not letting your grace be in vain. But may we instead embrace the fullness of your kingdom and enter in with open and glad hearts. Praying as we do in the way that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Amen. All right, as we get ready to go out from here, just a reminder, if, if you're new here, be sure to stop by on your way out to grab a gift. Uh, we want to invite you to remain standing for the singing of the Hallelujah Chorus, a tradition that we have each year to end our service of resurrection by declaring that final hallelujah. And so we invite you to stand at attention as we proclaim that today. And as we go forth, may we always remember that Christ is risen. The Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. We might have to do this a couple more times. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed.